My wife and I recently finished watching the TV miniseries All the Light You Cannot See. It was really excellent. It takes place in uh, France during World War II, and at the beginning, the Nazis have control. But by the end of the final episode, the Allied forces have come into this city, this bombed out city, and they are marching their way through the street, and the tanks are rolling, and people come flocking out of their houses, leaning out of their windows, waving flags. Some of the men are clapping their hands. Women are going up to soldiers and kissing them. Um, the children hop up onto the tanks to get a ride. And the soldiers lean over and give them candy. It is the scene of unbelievable celebration and jubilation because the liberators have arrived. After so many years of devastation, they are free. Well, in our story, as we have been following the book of Exodus, the people of Israel have cried out for liberation and they are not free. God heard the cry of his people Israel and he saw them. They had been enslaved by the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, and some of his ancestors for many, many years. Well, God gave the Pharaoh, as we have seen, opportunities to liberate the people, but Pharaoh, hardened of heart, refused. So God unleashed his mighty power against the stubborn king. Plague after worsening plague, and still Pharaoh would not let the people go. After 10 devastating plagues, Egypt is in ruins. Now last week in that 10th and final plague, God protected Israel while all Egypt suffered the loss of firstborn, both human and animals. Well, now what's going to happen? We begin where we left off, Exodus chapter 12, verse 31. It's the middle of the night, the same night, in fact, of that 10th plague. And Pharaoh asks to see Moses and his brother Aaron. This could be very bad. I mean, think about it. Pharaoh has just lost his firstborn son. He has got to be really upset. And Moses and Aaron were God's mouthpieces. This happened because of them. So is Pharaoh going to take out some sort of angry vengeance upon them? Well, once Moses and Aaron arrive, Pharaoh tells them this. Hurry and get your people out of here. Now, you might remember when Moses first asked Pharaoh permission to allow the people of Israel to leave, he only asked for a short trip to go out into the desert so that they could have a religious festival to worship their God. Well, now, ten plagues later, Pharaoh kind of references that original request. Go worship the Lord, he says, as you've requested. And then he adds this surprising ending. And also, bless me, he says. I kind of wonder, is Pharaoh starting to show some softening of heart? Did he realize his own weakness when he was faced with the all-powerful plagues of God? Clearly, all he had to do was look around his life and he is defeated. It's undeniable. So whoever this God is that Moses and Aaron keep mentioning, clearly that God had astounding power. So Pharaoh was a believer. But was Pharaoh making a turn towards becoming a follower of that God? There is a huge gulf between follower and believer. Now, all we know is that Pharaoh finally relents of his hard heart and he lets Israel leave Egypt. But what's he thinking? Is he thinking this is just that weekend trip away to have this religious festival? Uh, or is he thinking, no, they are going to be leaving Egypt permanently? Well, there's some unanswered questions there yet. We're, we're not there. Very next verse, verse 33, we have a scene change. It's of the Israelites and their interaction with their Egyptian neighbors. The Egyptian neighbors seem to have, I think, a bit more of a down-to-earth perspective about this whole situation than their leader, Pharaoh. The Egyptians say to the Israelites, Leave or else we will die. 
I mean, they can kind of see the progression that these 10 plagues have been getting worse and worse and worse. They've gone from a nuisance to destruction to death. What could be next? If it wasn't just the death of the firstborn, and the next would be death for everyone, right? Well, the Israelites then, feeling this push from the Egyptians and following the Lord, they pack up everything as quickly as they can. And we heard about this back in chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Remember this? The Lord said that the Israelites were to ask the Egyptians for their possessions of gold and silver. It seems like a really unlikely situation back there when we first talked about it, but now we understand. The Egyptians are fearing for their lives. They're desperate for the Israelites to leave. And thus the Egyptians are going to do whatever it takes to get them out there as quickly as they can, including giving the Israelites valuable items. And then the event begins. The event for which the book of Exodus is named. The people of Israel leave. They exit. We learn that at the time, the number of men were around 600,000. And we're going to hear later in the book of Egypt in chapter, or the book of Exodus in chapter 38, was 603,550 men. When you add children onto that, and when you add women onto that, well over a million people are leaving. We also learn that many other people joined them. We don't know who that many other people is, but likely it might have been some Egyptians who thought to themselves that they would much rather be with the power of the God of the Israelites than Pharaoh who has been defeated. And along with the people, we learn that they bring large herds of livestock. As they left, they make cakes of unleavened bread, which we first heard about last week in chapter 12. Everything that they were doing was to be quick. They needed to get out of there. And then the author of Exodus gives us a summary in verses 40 through 42, noting that the people of Israel had been in Egypt for 430 years. But listen to this, the Lord kept vigil to bring them out of Egypt. Remember that phrase, this image of God vigilantly watching. And why? He's watching to liberate his people. From chapter 12, verse 40, 43, all the way through chapter 13, verse 16, God then gives Moses some instructions for how Israel is to remember this day and to celebrate this day, this Passover, this Feast of Unleavened Bread for generations to come. And he makes some interesting requests. He commands a very specific consecration. It's that of the firstborn male. God calls it a consecration and a redemption. Take a look at Exodus chapter 13, verses 14 through 16. God envisions a day when those firstborn sons who have been consecrated unto the Lord will turn to their parents and they'll ask, what does it mean that I am consecrated to God? To answer this question, God says that the people should tell the story of how their nation were slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, how stubborn Pharaoh refused to let them go. How God then sent the plagues and saved the people of Israel. Israelite parents, God says, should especially tell their children about that tenth and final plague. The one where God killed all the firstborn Egyptians, but he passed over the firstborn of the homes of the Israelites who had sacrificed an animal and had painted their door frames with the blood of that animal. And then the parents should tell their children, the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. See, by consecrating the firstborn sons to the Lord, they are responding to this redemption, this liberation that God has accomplished. He liberated them from Egypt. Now, at this particular moment when God is um, giving these commands to Moses, the Exodus is only a few hours old. And we have seen the power of God to liberate and redeem. He has taken the people from slavery to freedom. 
we see that our God is a liberating God. It's a fact that's undeniable in this story. But when I was in college, I went to a Bible college, I was taught that there was a heretical teaching about God, about the liberating God. It was called liberation theology. And the claim of my professors was that liberation theology, based in this Exodus story, was somehow replacing the good news of the gospel of Jesus. In places all over the world, they said, liberation theologians were saying that what was really important about God was not so much this gospel of Jesus to believe in, but God's desire to set slaves free, to relieve people from oppression of all kinds. And our professors were very concerned about this. And I think to some degree, rightly so. They said we should avoid all of that and focus only on the good news story of Jesus. As I've studied this over the years, my personal conviction is that I think my professors were involved in a bit of an overreaction. There's definitely extremes, no doubt, and we want to avoid those extremes. Liberation theologians could definitely take their, view, their viewpoint too far to the point where they ignore or avoid or even deny the content of the story of Jesus. Liberation, liberation theologians have sometimes expressed their theology such that the, the story of the gospel only matters to inspire us to help enslaved people be liberated. What I've come to believe is that a truly holistic, substantial gospel, the biblical gospel, is that we need both word and deed. Our God wants us to be liberated from slavery to sin, absolutely. And Jesus is the only way. But he also wants people who are oppressed to be liberated from whatever awful situation they're in. And if we take a look at the life of Jesus, he demonstrated both. He taught both. We should not attempt to see one as more important than the other. Spiritual slavery and physical slavery are both awful. So I find it unhelpful to try and rank them. But people might retort and say, but people's eternal destiny is far more important than their temporary travails here on earth. And they might say, yes, slavery is bad, but we should emphasize the preaching of the gospel in words, the content of the gospel, the story of the good news, and encourage people to believe in Jesus and be liberated from slavery to sin. And then others can address the physical slavery. Now, some of what they have to say and the heart behind it, I resonate with. Of course, we don't want people to experience eternity separated from God. Of course, we want people to be freed from slavery to sin. But I disagree with the viewpoint that somehow prioritizes them, leaving the deeds of the gospel, such as liberation, to a later time. Both are important, and we need to emphasize both. And we can do that without resorting to prioritizing or ranking. Jesus himself was passionate about preaching the gospel in both word and deed. He was famous for preaching the good news of the kingdom and for healing people, setting them free from all kinds of oppression. In fact, one time he visited his hometown of Nazareth and he went to the synagogue and he participated in, in the worship service. We learn that when he went to that particular worship service, they gave him the scroll, or they gave him the opportunity to read, and it's, here's what it says. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. I'm reading from Luke chapter 4. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus said, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Do you see he's got both? Gospel of word and deed in this passage. Jesus would go on to demonstrate how to live and demonstrate both the gospel of word and deed in our lives. And so in the end, we believe that our God is a liberating God, the heart that beats to liberate the oppressed, both physically and spiritually. 
And we follow God's heart when we do the same. So who are the, impre- the oppressed? Who are the enslaved in our world? Actual physical slavery in, in many places is eradicated in the sense that it's illegal. It's not eradicated in the sense because it still exists. The fair trade movement is one response to how modern slavery can be so hidden and and kind of wily and difficult to, to pin down. But fight slavery by being committed to fair trade products. Make sure workers are paid fair wages. Be aware of large corporations who have huge numbers of employees that are on welfare. I encourage you to investigate this. There are structures of injustice that keep people oppressed. Strive to tear down those structures. God wants people to be liberated from oppression. At the same time, boldly proclaim the good news of freedom from slavery to sin. That message is found only in Jesus. Let your neighbors know. Let your family know. Talk about Jesus. Talk about God who loves them and and wants them to be liberated from sin. So far, the story of the Exodus has now just begun. Israel is about to uh, end up and experience many more incredible adventures, some highs, some lows. But for now, I encourage you to dwell on the heart of our liberating God.